Okay, good morning church. How are we doing this morning? I apologize for about the two or three minute delay in going live here. Um, technology is an amazing, amazing thing. It's also sometimes a very complicated thing. So I think I figured out the faux pas that was happening back there, but I think we're good to go. So we should be streaming live. So if you're watching online, it's good to have all of you. I do have a few announcements this morning before we get started. Um, I'm actually going to say the first one. We do have, or we are singing at New Horizons today. Is that correct, Debbie? Yes. So we do have um, singing over there at New Horizons. If you want to be a part of that, we'd love to have you. Um, very, very excited about that. Uh, Bible study this week. Uh, Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Please, please be here. We didn't have many people this past week. It might have been the massive monsoon that we had, um, so that's okay. We'll hopefully have better weather this week. <clears throat> the ladies' retreat is coming up quickly. Uh, room cost is 150 That's That's coming up very quickly, two weeks from this weekend, right? Yeah, so that's uh, very, very interesting. It's going to be good. My wife's very, very excited. I know that. Um, and the, ch the kids that are getting baptized next week, we are a week away from our baptism service. I am very, very excited about that. We, instead of having three, we actually have five people that are being baptized now. Um, on top of that, we may even have a sixth. So I'm very, very excited about that. Looking forward to it. Going to be an amazing service. Please make sure you're here if you can be here next week. One of the most important beginnings in the life of a follower is um, the time that they get baptized and they come out of that tent. It's so life-changing. And they're going to want your support, your applause, your excitement. And so please, if you are able to be here next Sunday to support those uh, youth being baptized, please, please be here. Uh, Sunday, October 9th, we're going to have a special visit from one of our missionaries. Um, the missionary is going to remain nameless simply because of where they're located, uh, but they will be here. We will not be streaming live that week on Facebook, so for those of you that do watch, uh, we will not stream live for her safety, if that tells you anything. Uh, this person is, again, where they're located is, is in the in line of fire, and so we like to keep them safe, but also want to know what they're doing and, and keep us updated, and so we will not be live on Facebook that week. We are doing a Thanksgiving food drive this year for the mission. Uh, you can pick up a list of items back there on the ministry table. It says big yellow piece of paper that says the mission has exactly what we're collecting. Uh, you can start bringing that in as soon as Wednesday for Bible study or as soon as next week on Sunday. And so take a list and please help those people out that need it. And last but not least, we do not have a men's meeting this month. I made a scheduling error was all excited about it, and with the things happening in the church, in my life, and my kids, and Heather traveling to Ohio, we are actually not able to do the men's meeting. So, we will do it in October, I promise you. I know the ladies will also have their scheduled in October after their uh, women's retreat, and so there is no men's meeting this month as well. All right, I'll turn it over to y'all. Let's worship. Good morning, and do come to hear the missionary. You will enjoy them and the, and the stories they have to share. Uh, I, I, I can say this, it won't give anything away. She has been where she is serving for a long time. And uh, she has a lot of stories to share about how God has used her in this place in our world. Well, let's stand and sing praises to a glorious God, a holy God who loves us dearly and who is wanting to share life very clearly with us. Falling down before thee. 
Father God, we thank you so very much for your love for us, for the grace that allows us to come into relationship with you that has changed our lives and is changing our lives. will continue to minister to us until you call us home. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us sing of that grace. We serve a holy God. I'm not quite sure what the fullness of a holy God looks like. And I think we just get a glimpse of the majesty of God and the glory of God. He, we serve a holy God, but in love, he gave a son that we might have that intimate relationship with him. So we sing of his grace because it is by grace we are saved through faith, not of any works that any of us should do. So let's sing of this marvelous grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, prayer with the blood of the Lamb was sometimes just to drop back and sing some of those wonderful songs that remind us of the love and the glory of God. But also these newer songs help us praise him too, don't they? Give thanks to the Lord our God and King Love endures forever. For, For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is with us, forever. 
a mighty hand and outstretched arm. His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Thank you for your faithfulness in the support of the life of this congregation and the ministries that it is a part of. As, we, as the ushers come to wait upon us, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving. Father God, we thank you so very much for your faithfulness, for your goodness. We want to learn more and more what it means to see you as a holy God that calls us to a life of holiness. We thank you, Father, for the uh, ongoing understanding of how marvelous and majestic and wonderful your grace is. And we do want to praise you forever in everything that we do, not just here on Sunday mornings, but the way we live from day to day. And we thank you that we can be a part of the work that you are doing through us for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the world, for the sake of this community. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for this privilege to give back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. How do we respond to the grace of God? In any way possible, in any way that you can. And life, it's interesting how life changes, isn't it? We, yeah, life happens. <laughs> And our bodies change, our thinking changes, everything changes. But no matter what age we are, no matter what situation we are in, God says simply, let me be a part of what you are doing. Serve me and I will bless. So let's sing of that response to the holiness of God, to the grace of God, by singing, I will serve thee whatever way you can there's no pattern that's unique for or that's the same for all of us it's unique every way the Lord's going to use each one of us is different from the person next to you but however God wants to use you say yes Lord I'll let you do that I 
will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you get started this morning, I'm going to do the congregational prayer. I um, had a few given to me this morning. I'm going to shower, obviously, the entire uh, bulletin that has prayer requests, all the prayer requests you may not have given me, uh, plus the ones that were just given to me a moment ago here in a moment. But obviously, you saw me running around doing the announcements, talking as fast as the micro machine guy. Anybody remember the micro machine guy? Commercials? No, I talk fast sometimes. So, um, But well, have you ever had a morning or a situation where you feel like nothing's coming together, where like everything's falling apart, nothing's lining up as it should, and then God just calms you and everything works out? See, that's the kind of morning that I'm having. I got here, everything was good. Um, I was excited, woke up ready to go. I actually woke up with first alarm that I had, which isn't normal. And so I was ready to go, get here, set up the computer for live streaming, and then just one by one as a domino effect, things just started to go badly. What we need to realize is when those things are happening that, you know, there's an attack happening. There's a situation where, you know, we don't want... The devil doesn't want that, that message to get out. He doesn't want something to be spoken on. And so for me, it was, okay, I'm just going to simply turn this over to God this morning. Whatever's happening in my life, whatever's happening outside of it, I've got some issues at home, things I need to fix, son's car, things like that. I'm going to put all of that down, put it to the side, and I'm going to focus on my Lord and Savior this morning. So if you're having a morning like that or you've had a week like that, this morning as we go to the message after we do prayer here in a moment, 
Take your cares, take your anxieties, take your worries, set them down this morning. Give them to God and let your time here this morning focus on God. Focus on worshiping him, focus on hearing the word, the message, the way it's gonna speak to you this morning. Let this moment be God's, amen? Well, we're gonna go to prayer, like I said. If you look in the bulletin, I say this every week, there's several prayer requests in the bulletin and several that uh, Betty had given me and a few others. And I just wanna shower all of those. And if you have a prayer request, I've said this before, shoot me a text, an email, or reach out to me so I can get that on the, the Monday morning email, get that on Facebook so we can be praying. Uh, a lot happening in the life of the church. And so I wanna be able to, to shower everyone my own personal time in prayer, but so those of us that do take time to pray will also pray for those requests. So if you would, bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning we give this service to you, Lord. The message that's about to be spoken, God, I put in your hands. Whatever it is you want this congregation to hear, Lord, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I ask that you speak through me. Lord, we have a plethora of prayer requests this morning, Lord, and so I just give those to you. Every single one that you see on the bulletin, somebody's given to us, Lord. Some have been there for, for several weeks, Lord, and it's just something that we're, we're bringing to you and we'll continue to bring to you, Lord. We're two or more gathered, that's where you'll be, and we want to give those to you this morning. Lord, as far as the prayer requests that were given to me just a few moments ago, Lord, I want to shower that family in prayer as well. Um, definitely some urgent prayer requests, and so we bring those to you as well this morning. God, I can't uh, thank you enough for being able to be in a country where we can worship freely, where we can stand up here, preach the gospel without fear of persecution, Lord, and I, I pray we continue to take advantage of that. We continue to spread the gospel, continue to bring your name to people that need it, Lord. I've seen a lot of things happen in my year here, Lord, as we come up on that anniversary. I've seen so many people's lives changed. I've seen people coming to you. I've seen just doors being kicked down that we never thought would be possible, Lord. And so I pray for the people who came this morning, who weren't going to come, Lord, had talked all week, had been fighting within themselves that they didn't want to be here this morning, but they're here because they want to know you, Lord. They want their children to know you, Lord. So God, I pray for those people. I pray for this service. It's all in your hands. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, I hope you're all having a, a good week. Uh, like I said, my week's been a little bit of up and down this week. Got a lot of things going on, but that's okay. Such is life, right? That's when we turn those, uh, those worries, those uh, anxieties to, to our Lord. We're actually in the sixth week now uh, of our sermon series entitled Heroes in the Bible. I'm not sure if you've picked up on this knot, but anyone that has ever known me uh, knows that I am a talker. I know it's hard to believe, but I enjoy talking. Um, I'm a very good storyteller, and I think that's why God has been opening us up so much during this series. I love that these stories God has for us in the Old Testament, they can come to life right before our eyes, right inside the church while you're all listening on a Sunday morning. You know, sometimes I'm not, before I, I came to Christ, I'm not a big reader. I don't just pick up books to read. I know, call me, you know, the young generation, call me youth, whatever you want to be. I just don't like reading. Now, when I read the Word of God, I'm able to kind of transform and teleport to that time and be able to think about what it would have been like to be in that area during those times. So as we've been as I've been up here preaching and talking, what I'm trying to do is be able to bring some of these stories to life so you can all understand them better and understand the impact that they can have. Well, last week we finished our two-part lesson on Joseph and the kind of hero that he was. And the amazing thing about Joseph is he's just a man that we have to take after. Somebody who, you know, going through all the things that he went through, he still trusted in God. He knew that all the heartbreak that he had gone through, that God was preparing him for something amazing. So for those of you right now going through something, understand like Joseph, whatever it is, as hard as it is, he's preparing you for something amazing. Well, this week we're moving straight into one of my favorite heroes throughout all of scripture, and that hero is Moses. Everybody's heard of Moses, right? Nod your heads. Yes, we've heard of Moses. Good. Well, in Exodus chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, it says this. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt very sorry for him. 
This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then a sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Now, church, I think every one of us in this room this morning know, but Moses is one of the most prominent figures in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, Moses is the primary author of the Pentateuch. As we know it, or more simply, the first five books in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So if you didn't know that, there's a little bit of history for today. All are thought by many scholars and theologians to have, have been penned, mostly, by Moses. I would say that would put him in some pretty important company, wouldn't you? So because of this, we are going to actually, again, take two weeks to talk about this. I promise this isn't going to be a trend. I'm not going to do this all the time. But we are going to take two weeks to talk about him and explain exactly what made him such an impactful Bible hero. So while Abraham, who we talked about a few weeks ago, is often called the father of the faithful, Moses was the man that was chosen to bring redemption to his people. Now I'd have to say if a human being were chosen today to bring redemption to a group of people, that would have to make him a hero, right? I mean, look at the premise for all the superhero movies. We've, we've talked about that a little bit. The hero is constantly saving or avenging people, thus making him a hero. God specifically chose Moses out of everyone on earth at the time to, to lead the Israelites out of captivity that they were facing in Egypt. <clears throat> he asked Moses to deliver them to the promised land that he had set aside for them. And we first encounter Moses in the very first chapter of Exodus. And since we spoke about Joseph last week, this is basically where his story ends and where Moses' story begins. After Joseph rescued his family from the great famine and was reconciled with all of them, his family lived in Egypt for several generations until a pharaoh came into power that knew nothing about Joseph and what he had done for their land. So being the, the coward, if you will, that this pharaoh was, he immediately enslaved the Israelites for fear that they would grow too numerous and that they would rebel against him and his kingdom. Seems like a, a common theme in the Old Testament for the Israelites, doesn't it? Being enslaved and, and then being you know, taken from that. You see, God was blessing Abraham's descendants and because of this, the people, they were growing at massive rates. And this scared Pharaoh, scared him even more. So he took his evilness up an entire notch. He kicked it to a, a new level. He began having all of the male children born to the Hebrew people killed by throwing them into the Nile River. Now you think about that today. If you saw a president or you saw a dictator, saw some sort of leader doing something like this, I'm not going to say that things like this don't take place in parts of the world, but if you saw something like this in a main country with a main leader, this would make national news. It would be viral on social media. Everybody would be recording it on their cell phones. But see here, it wasn't you know, getting around everywhere, but these people, they knew what was happening Anybody in here seen the movie, The Prince of Egypt? It's an animated movie. Good movie. Nobody's seen that movie. Wow. Well, for those of you who have never seen it, this is where that animated movie starts to get really, really good. It's a children's movie that, although it's missing a few pieces of historical evidence, it's very, very good and pretty accurate compared to some of the Hollywood biblical, you know, shows that they put on today you can't trust a lot of what they put out in Hollywood that depicts the Bible but Prince of Egypt was actually pretty good it's entirely about the life of Moses so if you ever get the chance again I highly recommend it Prince of Egypt that's what it's called I have it if anyone needs to borrow it anyway in Exodus 2 we see Moses mother attempting to save her child by placing him in a basket and putting it into the Nile River and the amazing irony to it all is the fact that Pharaoh's daughter is the one that eventually found Moses floating down the river 
and adopts him as her own. And from what we can tell, Moses, he grew up in, in royalty, right? Or we at least assume that he did. And the amazing thing about Moses, in spite of the fact that he grew up in royalty, he never lost compassion for his people. See, I've used this example many times, but growing up in the United States, you know, whether we feel like we're rich, whether we feel like we're poor, whether we feel like we're somewhere in the middle class, Growing up in this great nation makes you part of the 1% richest people in the world. And so when you see people in this country that have compassion on people who are less fortunate, we'll just use that word, who are less fortunate, you know, that's the same situation that you see with, with Moses. He grew up in royalty. He was definitely very, very well off, but he never lost that compassion that he had for people. He grew up with it. He wanted to help people. So in Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, it says this. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? As we see in this passage of scripture, as Moses is, is becoming a man, as he's starting to, to mold into adulthood, he begins to really empathize with his fellow Hebrew people. You see, he was a hero for saving his fellow Hebrew the day before, and this was his, his first heroic act that I really picked on as I was reading. Moses knew that he looked different, right? He knew that he looked different from the other Egyptians, and knew that although he was clothed in riches, he was poor at heart. After uttering these words to his fellow Hebrew, one of them asked if he was going to kill him like he did the Egyptian the day before. And at this time, word got back to Pharaoh, right? Word got back to Pharaoh about the, the murder, and he wanted to kill Moses. So Moses fled to Midian to escape Pharaoh's wrath. And this is where we see Moses become a hero even more so. Than he already was. He, he rescues the daughter of Jethro from shepherds who were bullying them. And because of this, Jethro grants his daughter Zipporah to marry Moses. Don't fall asleep. Stay with me. I'm just going through the timeline here of Moses. I want you to stick with me. The next event that we encounter with Moses, and in my eyes, one of the most important events in the entire story of Moses, is his encounter with the burning bush. Everybody remembers that, right? That's not, there we go. All right, so now we're back on the same page. Now, I know many of you have heard this story many, many times. You've heard it since you were a child in Sunday school classes, but today I want to challenge you to think about it a little differently. You know, a lot of times why I love going back through this Old Testament, talking about these heroes, so often when you come to church, you talk about Christ, you talk about the cross, you talk about the resurrection, and again, very, very important. That's what we all build to in the Old Testament. But we need to go back at times and see these heroes of days gone by. We need to look at their obedience. We need to look at their faith and why they had such a faith in God. And so again, bear with me as we, we go through this. This verse is in Exodus chapter 3 and will be in verses 2 through 6. It says this. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a, from within a bush Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The burning bush where Moses encounters God face to face, right? This is the moment in time where, where God actually calls Moses to be the, the savior of his people, right? Now, how many of you in this room can say that you have actually had a face to face encounter with God some of us can some of us can't um, but for me 
I personally did. I had a face-to-face moment with God that stopped me dead in my tracks. And I've told you this before, especially when I shared my testimony, the very first sermon that I ever gave, but about God sobering me up, right? Sobering me up completely from a, a drunken stupor, from a life that was lived completely filled in sin, completely apart from Christ, absolutely just out of control. It, for those of you that have never heard my testimony, if you'd like to hear it, I, I can definitely talk to you about it. I'm actually not going to be at youth tonight. Um, I kind of wanted to share this with you all. Uh, Celebrate Recovery in the local area has asked me to come and give my testimony. And so I get to go and talk to some youth who are troubled, who have dealt with things like that, the older people, um, you know, adults that have, have been through that. And I'm very honored to be able to do that. You see, a lot of times when, when you've had these situations, when you come from that background, you oftentimes feel like you're not a person who can be loved. You're not a person who God can forgive for some of the things that they've done. And see, for me, my face-to-face encounter with God is something that I will never forget. You can literally have, you know, anybody in the world come up to me like, God's a fairy tale, it's a myth, it's some fictitious thing, and you'll never convince me otherwise because I personally have had that face-to-face encounter. I know many of you have as well, and when you've had that, it's an experience that stops you dead in your tracks that you'll never forget. It's the single greatest moment that I remember about God calling me to live for him, about God calling me into ministry. Well, in this moment, that's exactly what's happening to Moses. He's having that encounter with God. He's having that intimate moment that every one of us in this room, regardless if you've had that face-to-face or not, but that intimate moment when you know that life is about something more. Life isn't just what it is. You're not just born, grow up, pay taxes, work a job, try and get some retirement, and then you die. We know there's more to that. Everyone sitting in here, you wouldn't be sitting in this sanctuary watching online this morning if you didn't feel like there was something more, that life had a bigger purpose. And so again, when we talk about Moses, we think about our lives, we have to ask ourselves, we have to decide, do we live our our lives for ourselves or do we live our lives for? for God. We all come to that crossroad. Moses was faced with that in that moment. We go on to read in this chapter that Moses actually hid his face from the Lord. You see, many times in life when we are sinning behind closed doors and living for ourselves, we are hiding our face from the Lord because we are ashamed of who we are as people. I have news for you all. You might bring in your Sunday best. You know I keep it real, so I'm going to do that. You might bring in your Sunday best as you walk through the doors here at church and go home and live a life that God would look at you and say, what are you doing? You know he can see that, right? He can't just see through a hole in the ceiling here in the church and be like, they are wonderful people. Oh, I can't see what they're doing at their house or in the store, how they're treating people outside. He sees everything. He knows everything. So the same face you put on when you walk in the church on Sunday, you should be putting that same face, that same lifestyle while you're living in the streets, at your home, at your work, at your school, Monday through Saturday. See, I've told you all this as well. When I first encountered God, well, not obviously I talked about the face-to-face encounter. When I first started dabbling in church, when, you know, my mom was like, hey, you should come to church. I was like, okay, I'll go to church. I started to put on that face. I love that Sunday worship and loving God, then Monday through Saturday living my life the way I wanted to. Do you know how many people in this country do that today? They, it, it's unfortunate, it's sad, because they're not getting to experience the fullness of who God is. And so we have to understand God is so much more. Our relationship with him It's an every day, every minute, all-encompassing experience. It's not meant to just be, hey, come to Spirit Lake from 10 to 11 on Sunday, experience God, and we'll talk to you next week. That's not what it's supposed to be about. We as human beings, we, we tend to be ashamed of who we are on the inside without God, and because we are not holy creatures, we are not, we are not the holy creatures that we're supposed to be. So, In the image of God we see in the burning bush, 
It's something that to behold. It's something amazing. This appearance that he made to Moses, it's life-changing for him. And the amazing thing, whether or not you know it, this is the first time in the entire Bible, other pastors back me up on this, but it's the first time in the Bible that the word holy is used in reference to God. It's the very first time that it's used. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. It's the first time it's used. And it impacted Moses so much. Later, when he wrote about it, his victory hymn in Exodus chapter 15, he made sure to make mention of it. See, when you come into the sanctuary, you come into the church, this is a holy place. This is where we're to, to know God more. I had some friends this week. I joined a bowling league. Yes, I'm getting old. I joined a bowling league. And in that bowling league, I met a couple and was uh, talking to them. And they're like, are, is it okay if we come to your church like dressed in shorts and a t-shirt? I said, come as you are. Since you gotta dress all fancy. I said, I might be in like a collared shirt and some pants, but that's because I'm supposed to stand up there and preach. And so we kind of had a laugh about that, but so many people, they feel like they have to clean their life up before they can come through the door of a church. When in reality, coming to church, getting to know the brothers and sisters that you have in here, beginning that relationship with God, building on that relationship with God, you know what God's gonna do in the process? He's gonna begin to clean you up from the inside out. And that is the most beautiful, wonderful thing that you can ever imagine as that process begins to take place. So if you have friends and you have family that, that talk about, you know, I can't come to church, man, that place would just burn up if I walked through the door. How many of you have friends like that? We all do, yeah. Tell them about this God. Tell them to come as they are. Let the, let the messages start to speak to them. Let the people loving on them, coming up to them, who are you, what's your name? Let that start to speak to them. Everyone thinks that you've got, I've got to clean my life up first. If you're going to do that, you're going to be working for a very long time and you're never going to accomplish it. Next, we see God reveal to Moses his own personal name. And this is one of my favorite parts of the whole thing. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And there are several reasons why God did this. The Egyptians, see, they had many gods by different names. Moses wanted to know God's name so the Hebrew people would know exactly who had sent them. God called himself, I am. A name that describes his eternal power, his unchangeable character. I am that I am, declares God to be self-existent, without beginning, without end. It's also expressed in the term Yahweh, meaning I am the one who is. It is the most significant name for God in the Old Testament. Now I want to put a slight hold on talking about the burning bush for a moment and why God used that to get Moses' attention. The reason I want to do that is because something that, that many people miss that came after the initial instance with the bush is the excuses that Moses used as to why he shouldn't be the one to lead God's people out of Egypt. Excuses you and I use almost every single day as to why we aren't living for God. Excuses you and I use every single day as to why we aren't telling other people we know about God. <clears throat> now, most of us in this room know Moses is a leader, right? A great man. But this encounter that he has changes his life in so many generations that follow. It almost did not happen. He had so many excuses why God should use someone else and not him. How many times in life do we feel unworthy of God's love? How many times do we feel like we've slipped too far, we've stumbled, we talked about that a little bit. We feel like we're too far gone and there's no way back for us. I think we've all felt like that a time or two. I think we have friends and family that still feel like that. I know many times in my life before knowing the real Christ, I felt unworthy of God's love unworthy of a saving grace we feel oftentimes we don't amount to much when it comes to glorifying the kingdom of God you come you understand the cross you understand the work of it you love Jesus but who am I to go speak to somebody I'm not capable of doing that 
The truth is many people in the Bible felt the same exact way. Even Moses felt this way and made it abundantly clear to God using these five excuses. I'll be quick, but I want you to understand him. His first excuse, I'm not good enough. Moses was content with his shepherd life, to be honest. Most of us are content with our lives, right? I don't need to do much for the kingdom. Pastor does enough on Sunday mornings. You know, they do a youth group. That's great. We'll get you people that way. I don't need to serve. I don't have to. So content that perhaps most days he didn't remember the sin of taking another life. That's why I started this sermon off with that. God sees past the man or woman standing before him, and he sees the bigger picture. He sees eternity, our potential for good, and how our broken lives can fulfill his ultimate purpose and goal for humanity. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Every one of you has a purpose to glorify and build the kingdom of God. Don't forget that. His second excuse was, I don't have all the answers. You ever felt that way? I feel that way right now. I don't have all the answers. My kids ask me some things. Third grade math, I don't have all the answers. I feel like I'm really, really not smart sometimes. You see, as a boy, Moses, he was raised in Pharaoh's household. Therefore, he must have been well-read, well-educated, and yet he questioned his abilities. But he missed the point. It wasn't about him or what he could do. It was about our Lord and what he could do through him. So again, it's not about your ability. It's what God can do through each one of you. His third excuse was that people would not believe him or listen to his voice. And unfortunately, that excuse is why so many Christians oftentimes won't evangelize, won't talk about the Lord. As a pastor, I oftentimes think no one is listening to me. When you doze off and nod off, remember, I can see everybody in here. So just a heads up. I've got it on recording too, and I go back and watch on Monday and I make notes. No, I'm just kidding, I don't do that. <laughs> it's my job to listen to the Lord, to put it out there, and it's up for, to him to convict you all with what's being said. I can't follow all 80 of you around and see what you're doing Monday through Saturday. I don't have that kind of time. I have a family. I can't do that. But it, through the message, it's up for the Lord to convict you and move in your life Monday through Saturday, and I pray that he does that. The fourth excuse Moses came up with was that he was a terrible public speaker. And in my opinion, there was little truth to this. I mean, I'm a terrible public speaker, but God has called me to preach the gospel. God can and will help us overcome our shortcomings. We have plenty of biblical evidence of Moses speaking to his people perfectly fine. And if you ask me my honest opinion, I think this excuse was honestly his best sales pitch for the job to begin with. Because guess what? The Lord calls the unqualified to be qualified. And last but not least was his most desperate excuse of all when Moses finally said, please, Lord, anyone but me. When Moses finishes with his excuses, he shows amazing single-mindedness. He's slow to accept the call and the appointed work, but once he does, Moses holds on to it fastly. He holds on to it obediently, and he does it until his death. So if those of you sitting here this morning have been waiting for that perfect, you know, situation or that aha moment to actually do something with your faith, to get out and serve in your church, to do something big for the kingdom of God, this is your wake-up call. It doesn't take a perfect person. He calls the unqualified to be qualified, and that is all of us in this room this morning. Amen. So you know what? That's the perfect time. I'm going to stop right there. And now I want to turn your attention to the communion table. A place where I'd like us all to come together as one this morning. All of us unqualified brothers and sisters this morning that have no business speaking to anybody about God, that have no qualities or ability to advance the kingdom of God, to be called by our Lord to do such a thing. The Lord's Supper, it's a good time to stop and think about those heroes, all of those we talked about thus far. Think about the sacrifices they've made so you and I could have the gospel in our hands, so we could advance the gospel in our lives. 
I said it before, but let's not just take down the elements and let's not just make it. I want you to understand what you're doing. I want you to pause and reflect. And if you haven't thought about what your purpose is on this earth when it comes to the kingdom of God, this is your moment to do so. I can promise you this, and I I feel the Lord, I can promise you this, your calling for the kingdom of God was not to come and make the seat warm with your butt. That I can promise you. Your calling is to get up, to take your faith and put it into action, whatever that action is. You know, as a pastor, it's my job to help you figure that out, to talk with you, to pray with you. But if I don't have people coming to me to talk and pray with, it's hard for me to help you. But I can promise you it's not to sit still, to sit idly by and let someone else do it. That is not the calling that we have. Let's truly think about Moses hearing those words, I am who I am from our Lord. What does that mean to you this morning, church? Paul, if you'd come up here and help me pass these out. And for those of you that can't get up, Ryan has some that he's gonna pass around. And if you want, we'll start on this side, and this side can come down the road for Paul. the mound, didn't you? Does everybody have the elements that wanted them this morning? Okay. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, it says this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. My friends, his body was broken on our behalf. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, 
we read, In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. My friends, this is the blood poured out for us all. Well, as I close this morning, church, and the band makes its way forward here, <clears throat> the Moses we read about in the beginning of Exodus is the same man that shows remarkable courage, obedience, and strength of character just a few chapters later. We're going to talk about that more next week. But today, my friends, we must realize that in identifying himself as I am, God is declaring that he has always existed, that he currently exists, and that he will always exist. From before time began as we know it until far past whenever we can comprehend. When we believe in Jesus Christ, I want you to understand that God, he accepts you as holy. When we talk about the holy ground, he accepts you as holy only because Jesus is holy. And because of this, going forward, when God looks at us, he sees his perfect and blameless son. I want you to gracefully ponder that over the next week and really think about the impact Moses had not only back then, but he still continues to have in scripture to this very day. Next week, we'll continue talking about Moses the hero and the exodus from Egypt. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for communion. Thank you for brothers and sisters who love one another. Thank you for those that were impacted by the message today and they're going to listen and really seek your heart as far as what they want to do next in their life, Lord. Lord, to have a, a church that has 80 people in it, Lord, 80, 90 people, whatever it is, Lord, there is life. There is children. There is a future. There is big things happening here in the life of Spirit Lake, Lord. I turn that over to you. I place it in your hands. I pray that you will continue to guide me as I minister to the people, as I continue to shepherd them and guide them into what you have for them. I pray for all of us as we embark our own personal journeys, Lord, that each one of us each day will just continue to be satisfied and, and filled by you. Let the Spirit quench our thirst for whatever it is we're searching for in this world. God, as we play this last song, let us open our hearts let us raise our hands. Let us worship you. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God used Joseph by sending him to Egypt to save his people. Hundreds of years later, God used Moses to deliver his people from Egypt to save them. You see, we may not always understand why life happens the way it does. Do we go to Egypt? Do we not go to Egypt? Trust in the Lord. Whenever you see life happening and life is you're experiencing life, whatever that might be, it may not make sense to you, but know that God is at work in the lives of those who are faithful to him, who trust him, who obey him, who follow him, God is at work even in the smallest things he wants to use us let's stand together as we sing trust and obey when we walk with the Lord in the light of his Glory he sheds on our way While we do his good will He abides with us still And we all who will trust and obey Trust and obey For there
there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet. We will walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he stands we will go. When we're near, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. To be happy in Jesus, to trust and obey. You see, this week, social media can be a fun place for those of us that have it, can it? Um, this week, I, I put a post up there, and it happens most weeks. Got some feedback, got some arguing in the comments. It happens. I'm okay with that. I got broad shoulders. He's given me those. Um, but sim- all it was was the s- statistic that I gave you. About 93% of families will come to Christ if the Father comes first. It's the only thing I put on there. It was a statistic. It was the actual image of it. And you started getting a lot of feedback. Somehow it shifted to... Well, what about those people that don't know Jesus? What about those people that have other faiths? And and simply, again, to be happy, to trust in Jesus, to trust and obey, we have to understand that Jesus is the only way. There is no other way. Jesus is the only way. And so as cordially, as nicely as I could, I relayed that to the people on Facebook. I'm not as argumentative as I used to be. I'm very good at putting words into making them thoughtful, but I let them know that there was no other way but Jesus. And you see, we have to have broad shoulders. We have to have courage to stand up for that faith because if we do believe, if we believe what this right here, I won't pick it up because it's very de- decorative and things, but this right here, if we believe what this holy word says, and as Christians, those of us sitting here, we should believe every word in that Bible. If we believe what it says, then we will have the courage to stand strong and tell people that Jesus is, in fact, the only way. Think about that this week. Focus on that, because I guarantee you at some point it's going to pop up this week where you'll be able to share it, and I do pray that you do. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for the message. Thank you for for speaking through me this morning. It's just so awe-inspiring at times to to feel you, feel the Spirit flow through me as I preach. And I thank you for that. And I pray each person took something from it, Lord. I pray that this week as we go into our jobs, as we go into our community, that we will share, that we will trust and obey. We know that Jesus is the only way. We know that we need to talk to others about him. And I pray that you give us the strength and the courage to do so, Lord. Help us to be obedient to what it is that you have in our life, the same way Moses was obedient to you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.